Sinclair's reading of Timon of Athens. We will begin this evening with the reading of Shakespeare's Sonnet 99. The forward violet, thus did I chide, Sweet thief, whence didst thou steal thy sweet that smells, If not from my love's breath? The purple pride, which on thy soft cheek for complexion dwells, In my love's veins thou hast too grossly dyed. The lily I condemned for thy hand, And buds of marjoram had stolen thy hair. The roses fearfully on thorns did stand, One blushing shame, another white despair. A third, nor red nor white, had stolen of both, and to his robbery had annexed thy breath. But for his theft, in pride of all his growth, a vengeful canker eat him up to death. More flowers I noted, yet I none could see, but sweet or color it had stolen from thee. And now, Timon of Athens. Act One, Scene One. Athens, a, a hall in Timon's house. Enter poet, painter, jeweler, merchant, and others at several doors. Good day, sir. Well, I have not seen you long. How goes the world? Where, sir, as it grows? Aye, that's well known. But what particular rarity, what strange, which manifold record not matches? See, magic of bounty, all these spirits thy power hath conjured to attend. I know the merchant. I know them both. The other's a jeweler. Oh, tis a worthy lord. Nay, that's most fixed. A most incomparable man, breathed as it were, to an untirable and continuate goodness he passes. Oh, pray, let's see it for the Lord Timon, sir. <clears throat> Reciting to himself. When we for recompense have praised the vile, it stains the glory in that happy verse which aptly sings the good. Tis a good form. Looking at the jewel. And rich. Here is a water. Look ye. You are wrapped, sir, in some work, some dedication to the great lord. Ah, a thing slipped idly from me. Our posy is as a gum which oozes from whence tis nourished. The, the fire of the flint shows not till it be struck. Our gentle flame provokes itself and like the current flies each bound it chafes. Oh, what have you there? A picture, sir. When comes your book forth? Upon the heels of my presentment, sir. Let's see your piece. Tis a good piece. Ooh, so tis. This comes off well and excellent. Indifferent. Admirable. How this grace speaks his own standing. What a mental power this eye shoots forth. How big imagination moves in this lip. To the dumbness of the gesture one might interpret. It is a pretty mocking of the life. Here is a touch. Is it good? I will say of it, it tutors nature. Artificial strife lives in these touches, livelier than life. Enter certain senators and pass over. How this lord is followed. Senators of Athens, happy man. Look more. You see this confluence, this great flood of visitors. I have in this rough work shaped out a man whom this beneath world doth embrace and hug with amplest entertainment. My free drift halts not particularly, but moves itself in a wide sea of wax. No leveled malice infects one comma in the course I hold, but flies in eagle flight bold and forth on, leaving no tract behind. How shall I understand you? I will unbolt to you. 
You see how all conditions, how all minds, as well of glib and slippery creatures, as of grave and austere quality, tender down their services to Lord Timon. His large fortune upon his good and gracious nature, hanging subdues and properties to his love and tendance, all sorts of hearts, yea, from the glass-faced flatterer to Apomantus, that few things loves better to abhor him than to abhor himself, even he drops down the knee before him and returns in peace most rich in Timon's nod. I saw them speak together. Sir, I have upon a high and pleasant hill feigned fortune to be thrown. The base of the mount is ranked with all deserts, all kinds of natures that labor on the bosom of this sphere to propagate their states. Amongst them all, whose eyes are on this sovereign lady fixed, one do I personate of Lord Timon's fame, whom fortune with her ivory hand wafts to her, whose present grace to present slaves and servants translates his rivals. This conceived to scope, this throne, this fortune, and this hill, methinks with one man beckoned from the rest below, bowing his head against the sleepy mount to climb his happiness, would be well expressed in our condition. Mm, nay, sir, but hear me on. All those which were his fellows but of late, some better than his value, on the moment follow his strides. His lobbies fill with tendance, rain sacrificial whisperings in his ear, make sacred even his stirrup, and through him drink the free air. I, Mary, what of these? Oh, when fortune in her shift and change of mood spurns down her late beloved, all his dependents, which labored after him to the mountain's top, even on their knees and hands, let him slip down, not one accompanying his declining foot. His common. A thousand moral paintings I can show that shall demonstrate these quick blows of fortune more pregnantly than words. Yet you do well to show Lord Timon that mean eyes have seen the foot above the head. <laughs> sound. Imprisoned, as he say it. Addressing himself courteously to every suitor, a messenger from Ventidius talking with him, Lucilius and other servants following. Imprisoned, imprisoned, as he say you. I, my good lord, five talents in his debt, his means most short, his creditors most straight. Your honorable letter he deserves, he desires to those who have shut him up, which failing periods his comfort. Noble Ventidius, well, oh, I am not of that feather to shake off my friend when he must need me. I do know him a gentleman that well deserves help, which he shall have. I'll pay the debt and free him. Your lordship ever binds him. Commend him to me. I will send his ransom, and being enfranchised, bid him come to me. It is not enough to help the feeble up, but to support them after. Fare you well. All happiness to your honor. Exit. Enter an old Athenian. Lord Timon, hear me speak. Freely, good father. Thou hast a servant named Lucilius. I have so. What of him? Most noble Timon. Call the man before thee. Uh, Tends he here or no, Lucilius? Here, at your lordship's service. Uh, this fellow here, Lord Timon, this uh, thy creature, by night frequents my house. I am a man that from my first have been inclined to thrift, and my estate deserves an heir more raised than one which holds a trencher. Well, what further? Only one only daughter have I, no kin else, one whom I may confirm what I have got, confer what I have got. The maid is fair, oh, the youngest for a bride, and I have a bread her at my dearest cost and qualities of the best. This man of thine attempts her love. I pray thee, noble Lord, join with me to forbid him her resort. Uh, myself has spoke in vain. 
The man is honest. Therefore, he will be a uh, time, and his honesty rewards him in itself. I, it must not bear my daughter. Does she love him? She is young and apt. Our own precedent passions do instruct us what levities in youth. To love you, the maid. Aye, my good lord. And she accepts of it. If, if in her marriage my consent be missing, I call the gods to witness, I will choose mine heir from forth the beggars of the world and dispossess her all. Hmm. How shall she be endowed if she be mated with an equal husband? Three talents on the present. In future, all. This gentleman of mine hath served me long. To build his fortune, I will strain a little, for is a bond in men. Give him thy daughter. What you bestow, in him I'll counterpoise, and make him way with her. Most noble lord, pawn me to this your honour. <laughs> she is his. I hand to thee mine honour on my promise. Humbly, I thank your lordship. Never the state or fortune fall into my keeping, which is not owed to you. Exeunt Lucilius and old Athenian. Vouchsafe my labor and long live your lordship. I thank you, you shall hear from me anon. Go not away, what have you there, my friend? A piece of painting which I do beseech your lordship to accept. Ah, oh, painting is welcome. The painting is almost a natural man. Or, since dishonor traffics with man's nature, he is but outside. These penciled figures are even such as they give out. I like your work, and you shall find I like it. Wait attendance till you hear further from me. The gods preserve thee. Well, fare you, gentlemen. Give me your hand. We must needs dine together. Sir, your jewel has suffered under praise. What, my lord? Dispraise? <laughs> A more satiety of commendations. If I should pay you for it, as till it extolled, it would unclue me quite. My lord, tis rated as those which sell would give. But you well know, things of like value deferring in the owners are prized by their masters. Belief, dear lord, you mend the jewel by the wearing it. <laughs> well marked. No, my good lord, he speaks the common tongue, which all men speak with him. Ah, look, who comes here? Will you be chid? Enter Apamantus. He'll spare none. Good morrow to thee, gentle Apamantus. Till I be gentle, stay thou for thy good morrow, when thou art Timon's dog and these knaves honest. Why dost thou call them knaves? Thou knowst them not. Are they not Athenians? Yes. Then I repent not. Thou knowest I do, I called thee by thy name. Thou art proud, Apamantus. Of nothing so much as that I am not like Timon. Whither art thou going? To knock out an honest Athenian's brains. That's a deed thou die for. Right. If doing nothing be death by the law. How likes this picture, Epimanthus? The best, for the innocents. Wrought he not well that painted it? He wrought better that made the painter, and yet he's but a filthy piece of work. You're a dog. Thy mother's of my generation. What's she if I be a dog? Will dine with me, Apimantus? No. I eat not lords. And thou shouldst thou anger ladies. Oh, they eat lords, so they come by great bellies. That's a lascivious apprehension. So thou apprehendest it. Take it for thy labor. How dost thou like this jewel, Apimantus? Not so well as plain dealing, which will not cost a man a doit. 
does the sound think it's worth? Not worth my thinking. How now, poet? How now, philosopher? Thou liest. Art not one? Yes. Then I lie not. Art not a poet? Yes. Then thou liest. Look in thy last work, where thou hast feigned him a worthy fellow. That's not feigned. He is so. Yes, he's worthy of thee, and to pay thee for thy labor. He that loves to be flattered is worthy of the flatterer. Heavens, that I were a lord. What wouldst thou do then, Ap uh, Apamantus? Even as Apamantus does now, hate a lord with my heart. What? Myself? Aye. My Thor? That I had no angry wit to be a lord. Art not thou a merchant? Aye, Apamantus. Traffic confound thee if the gods will not. If traffic do it, the gods do it. Traffic's thy god, and thy god confound thee. Trumpet sounds. Enter a messenger. Uh, what trumpet's that? Tis Asclepiades, and some twenty horse, all of companionship. Oh, pray, entertain them. Give them guide to us. Exeunt some attendants. You must needs dine with me. Go not you hence till I have thanked you when dinner's done. Show me this piece. I am joyful of your sights. Enter Alcibiades with the rest. Most welcome, sir. So, so, there. Aches contract and starve your supple joints, that there should be no small love amongst these sweet knaves and all this courtesy. The strain of man's bred out into baboon and monkey. Sir, you have saved my longing, and I feed most hungrily on your sight. <laughs> I'd welcome, sir. Ere we depart, we'll uh, share a bounteous time in different pleasures. Hey, you let us in. Exeunt, all except Apamantus. Enter two lords. What time of day is to Apamantus? Time to be honest. That time serves still. The more accursed thou that still omitst it. Thou art going to Lord Timon's feast? Aye, to see meat fill knaves and wine heat fools. Fare thee well, fare thee well. Thou art a fool to bid me farewell twice. Why, Apamantus? Shouldst have kept one to thyself, for I mean to give thee none. Hang thyself. No, I will do nothing at thy bidding. Make thy request to thy friend. Away, unpeaceable dog, or I'll spurn thee hence. I will fly like a dog the heels of the ass. Exit. He's opposite to humanity. Come, shall we in and taste Lord Timon's bounty? He outgoes the very heart of kindness. He pours it out. Plutus, the god of gold, is but his steward. No mead, but he repays sevenfold above itself. No gift to him, but breeds the giver a return exceeding all use of quittance. The noblest mind he carries that ever governed man. Long may he live in fortunes. Shall we in? I'll keep you company. Exeunt. Act One, Scene Two. A banqueting room in Timon's house. Hoboys playing loud music. A great banquet served in. Flavius and others attending. Then enter Timon, Alcibiades, lords, senators, and Ventidius. Then comes, dropping after all, Apamentus, discontentedly like himself. Most honored Timon, it hath pleased the gods to remember my father's age and call him to long peace. He is gone happy and has left me rich. Then as in grateful virtue I am bound to your free heart, I do return those talents, doubled with thanks and service from whose help I derived liberty. Oh, by no means, honest Ventidius. You mistake my love, I gave it freely ever, and as none can truly say he gives, if he receives. If our betters play at that game, we must not dare to imitate them. False that are rich are fair. A noble spirit. Nay, my lord. They all Ceremony. ceremoniously looking on Timon. Ceremony was but devised at first to set a gloss on faint deeds, hollow welcomes, recanting goodness, sorry ere tis shown. But where there is true friendship, there needs none. They sit. Or welcome are ye to my fortunes, and my fortunes to me. They sit. 
My lord, we always have confessed it. Oh, confessed it. Hanged it, have you not? Oh, Abermantus, you are welcome. No, you shall not make me welcome. I have come to thee to thrust me out of doors. Hi, thou art a churl. You've got a humour there that does not become a man. There's much to blame. They say, my lords, ira fura bravis est, but bond man is ever angry. Oh, let him have a table by himself, for he does not neither affect company, nor is he fit for it indeed. Let me stay at thine apparel, Timon. I come to observe. I give thee warning on it. I take no heed of thee. Thou art an Athenian, therefore welcome. I myself would have no power. Prithee, let my meat make thee silent. I scorn thy meat. T'would choke me, for I should ne'er flatter thee. O you gods, what a number of men eat Timon, and he sees them not. It grieves me to see so many dip their meat in one man's blood, and all the madnesses, he cheers them up, too. I wonder men dare trust themselves with men. Methinks they should invite them without knives. Good for their meat, and safer for their lives. There's much example for it. The fellow that sits next to him now, parts bread with him, pledges the bread with him in a divided draught, is the readiest man to kill him. It's been proved. If I were a huge man, I should fear to drink at meals, lest they should spy my windpipe's dangerous notes, Great men should drink with harnesses on their throats. My lord in heart, and let the health go round. Let it flow this way, my good lord. Flow this way, a brave fellow. He keeps his tides well. Those healths will make thee and thy state look ill, Timon. Here's that which is too weak to be a sinner. Honest water, which ne'er left man in the mire. This and my food are equals. There's no odds. Feasts are too proud to give thanks to the gods. Apamantus grace, immortal gods, I crave no pelf. I pray for no man but myself. Grant I may never prove so fond to trust man on his oath or bond, or a harlot for her weeping, or a dog that seems a-sleeping, or a keeper with my freedom, or my friends if I should need him. Amen. So, fall to it. Rich men sin. And I eat root. Eats and drinks. Much good ditch thy heart, Epimentus. Captain Alcibiades, your heart's in the field now. My heart is ever at your service, my lord. You had rather be at breakfast of enemies than a dinner of friends. So they were bleeding new, my lord. There's none like them. I could wish there's no meat like them. I could wish my best friend at such a feast. Would all those fatterers were thine enemies then, that then thou might kill him and bid me to him? Might we but have that happiness, my lord, that you would once use our hearts, whereby we might express some part of our zeals, we should think ourselves forever perfect. Oh, no doubt, my good friends. The gods themselves have provided that I shall have much help from you. How had you been my friend else? Why have you that charitable title from thousands? Did you not chiefly belong to my heart? I have told more of you to myself than you can with modesty speak in your own behalf. And thus far, I confirm you. Oh, you gods, think I what need we have of any friends if we should ne'er have need of them? They were the most needless creatures living. Should we never have use for them and would most resemble sweet instruments hung up in cases that keep their sounds to themselves? Why, I have often wished myself poorer that I might come nearer to you. We are born to do benefits and what better or properer and we can our own and the riches of our friends. Oh, what a precious comfort it is to have so many, like brothers, commanding one another's fortunes. Oh, joy, e'en made away ere can be born. My eyes cannot hold out water, methinks. To forget their faults, I drink to you. 
Thou weepest to make them drink, Tywin. Joy had the like conception in our eyes, and at that instant, like a babe sprung up. <laughs> I laugh to think that babe a bastard. I promise you, my lord, you moved me much. Much? Tuck it within. What means that, Trump? Enter a servant. Oh, no? Please you, my lord, there are certain ladies most desirous of admittance. Ladies! What are their wills? There comes with them a forerunner, my lord, which bears that office to signify their pleasures. I pray let them be admitted. Enter Cupid. Hail to thee, worthy Timon, and to all that of his bounty's taste. The five best senses acknowledge thee, their patron, and come freely to gratulate thy plenteous bosom. The ear, taste, touch, smell, pleased from thy tail rise. They only now come but to feast thine eyes. Uh, welcome all. Let them have kind admittance. Music, make their welcome. Exit Cupid. You see, my lord, how ample you're beloved. Music, re-enter Cupid with a mask of ladies as Amazons, with lutes in their hands, dancing and playing. Poor day, what a sweep of vanity comes this way. They dance, they are mad women, like madness is the glory of this life. As this pomp shows to a little oil and root, we make ourselves fools to disport ourselves and spend our flatteries to drink those men upon whose age we void it up again with poisonous spite and envy. Who lives that's not depraved or depraves? Who dies that bears not one spurn to their graves or their friend's gift? I should fear those that dance before me now would one day stamp upon me. It's been done. Men shut their doors against a setting sun. The lords rise from table with much adoring of Timon, and to show their loves, each singles out an Amazon, and all dance, men with women, a lofty strain or two, to the hot boy, to the hoboys, and cease. You have done our pleasures much grace, fair ladies. Set a fair fashion on our entertainment, which was not half so beautiful and kind. You have added worth and, to, and luster and entertain me with mine own device. I am to thank you for it. My lord, you take us even at the best. Faith for the worst is filthy and would not hold taking, I doubt me. Ladies, there is an idle banquet attend you. Please to dispose yourselves. Most thankfully, Most my, thankfully my lord. Flavius. Cupid, lord. Ladies. The little casket, bring me hither. Yes, my lord. More jewels hence. There's no crossing in him in his humor. Aside. Oh, else I should tell them when well in faith I should. When all spent, he'd be crossed, and then he could. Tis pity Bounty had not eyes behind, that man might never be wretched from his mind. Exit. Where be our men? Here, my lord, in readiness. Our horses. Re-enter Flavius with the casket. Oh, my friends, I have one word to say to you. Look you, my good lord, I must entreat you. Honour me so much as to advance this jewel. Accept it and wear it, kind my lord. I am so far already in your gifts. So are we all. <laughs> Enter a servant. My lord, there are certain nobles of the Senate newly alighted and come to visit you. They are fairly welcome. I beseech your honor, how shape me a word it does concern you near. Near? I then another time I'll hear thee. I pray thee, let's be provided to show him some entertainment. I scarce know how. <laughs> Enter a second servant. Uh, may it please your honor, Lord Lucius, out of his free love, hath presented to you four milk-white horses trapped in silver. I shall accept them fairly. Let the presents be worthily entertained. Enter a third servant. And now, what news? Please you, my lord, that honorable gentleman, Lord Lucius, treats your company tomorrow to hunt with him, and has sent your honor two brace of greyhounds. 
I'll hunt with him, and let them be received, not without fair reward. Aside. What will this come to? He commands us to provide and give great gifts, and all out of an empty coffer. Nor will he know his purse, or yield me this, to show him what a beggar his heart is, being of no power to make his wishes good. His promises fly so beyond his state that what he speaks is in all debt he owes for every word. He is so kind that now he pays interest for it. His lands put to their books. Well, would I were gently put out of office before I were forced out. Happier is he that has no friend to feed, and such then do even enemies exceed. I bleed inwardly for my lord. Exit. You do yourselves much wrong to make too much of your own merit. Here, my lord, a trifle of our love. With more than common thanks, I will receive it. Oh, he's the very soul of bounty. Oh, and now I remember, my lord, you gave good words the other day of a bay courser I rode on. It is yours, because you liked it. Uh, oh, I beseech you, pardon me, my lord, in that. You may take my word, my lord, I know no man can justly praise, but what he does affect. I weigh my friend's affection with mine own. I'll tell you true, I'll call to you. Oh, none so welcome. So welcome. I take all and your several visitations so kind to heart. There's not enough to give. Methinks I could deal kingdoms to my friends and ne'er be weary. Alcibiades, thou art a soldier, therefore seldom rich. It comes in charity to thee. For all thy living is amongst the dead, and all the lands thou hast lie in a pitched field. I defiled land, my lord. We are so virtuously bound. And you, am I to you? So infinitely endeared. All to you. Lights, all lights. The best of happiness, honor and fortunes keep with you, Lord Timon. Ready for his friends. Exeunt all but Appomantus and Timon. What a coils here. Serving of becks and jutting out of bums. I doubt whether their legs be worth the sums that are given for them. Friendships full of dregs, methinks. False hearts should never have sound legs. Thus honest fools lay out their wealth on courtesies. Now, Acamanthus, if thou wert not sullen, I would be good to thee. No, I'll nothing. For if I should be bribed too, there would be none left to rail upon thee, and then thou would sin the faster. Thou givest so long time, and I fear me thou wilt give thyself away in paper shortly. What need these feasts, pomps, and vain glories? Nay, and you begin to rail on society once I'm sworn not to give regard to you. Farewell. Come with better music. Exit. So, thou wilt not hear me now. Thou shalt not then. I'll lock thy heaven from thee. Oh, that men's ears should be to counsel deaf, but not to flattery. Exit. Act two, scene one, a senator's house. Enter senator with papers in his hand. And late five thousand, to Varro and to Isadore, he owes nine thousand, besides my former sum, which makes it five and twenty. Still in motion of raging waste? It cannot hold, it will not. If I want gold, steal but a beggar's dog and give it to Timon. Why, the dog's coin's gold. If I would sell my horse and buy twenty more, better than he, why, give my horse to Timon. Ask nothing, give it to, give it him. It folds me straight and able horses. No porter at his gate, but rather one that smiles and still invites all that pass by. It cannot hold. No reason can found his state in safety. Cephas, ho! Cephas, I say! Enter Cephas. Here, sir, what is your pleasure? 
Get on your cloak and haste, haste you to Lord Timon. Importune him for my monies. Be not seized with slight denial, nor then silenced when commend me to your master and the cap plays in the right hand thus. But tell him, my uses cry to me. I must serve my turn out of mine own. His days and times are past have, and my reliances on his fracted dates have smit my credit. I love and honor him, but not, but must not break my back to heal his finger. Immediate are my needs and my relief must not be tossed and turned to me in words, but find supply immediate. Get you gone, put on a most importunate aspect, a visions of demand. For I do fear when every feather sticks in his own wing, Lord Timon will be left a naked gull, which flashes now a phoenix. Get you gone. I go, sir. I go, sir. Take the bonds along with you and have the dates in contempt. I will, sir. Go. Exeunt. Act two, scene two, the same, a hall in Timon's house. Enter Flavius with many bills in hand. No care, no stop, so senseless of expense that he will neither know how to maintain it nor cease his flow of riot, takes no account. Now things go from him, nor resumes, no care of what is to continue, never mind, was to be so unwise, to be so kind. What shall be done? He will not hear till feel. I must be round with him. Now he comes from hunting, five, five, five. Enter Capet and the servant of Isidore and Varro. Good even, Varro. What? You come for money? It is, and yours too. Isidore? Hmm. Would we were all discharged? Mm. Here comes the Lord. Enter Timon, Alcibiades, and Lords and Company. As soon as dinner's done, we'll forth again, my Alcibiades. With me? Uh, what is your will? Lord, here is a note of certain dues. Dues? When say you? Of Athens here, my lord. Noted my steward. Please it your lordship, he hath put me off to the succession of new days this month. My master is awkward by great occasion to call upon his own, and humbly prays you that you, that with your other noble parts, you'll suit in giving him his right. Mine honest friend, I prithee, but repair to me next morning. Nay, good my lord. Contain thyself, good friend. He humbly prays your speedy payment. If you did know, my lord, my master's wants, and I am sent expressly to your lordship. Give me breath. I do beseech you, good my lord. Keep on, I'll wait upon you instantly. Exeunt Alcibiades and lords to Flavius. Come hither. Pray you, how goes the world? But I am thus encountered with clamorous demands of eight broke bonds and a detention of long since due debts against mine honour. Please, you gentlemen, the time is unagreeable to this business. Your importunity cease till after dinner, that I may take his lordship and understand wherefore you are not paid. Do so, my friends. See them well entertained. Exit. Pray you draw near. Exit. Enter Appomantis and Fool. Stay, stay. Here comes the Fool with Appomantis. Let's have some sport with him. Thus dialogue with thy shadow. No, tis to thyself. To the Fool. Come away. No, thou stand single. Thou art not on him yet. Where is the Fool now? He last asked the question. Poor rogues and usurers men, bods between gold and want. What, are we Appomantis? Asses. Why? That you ask me what you are and do not know yourselves. Speak to him, fool. Uh, how do you, gentlemen? Grabbersy's good fool, how does your mistress? She's even setting on water to scald such chickens as you are. 
would we see you at Corinth? Good. Gramercy. Enter page. Uh, look you, here comes my mistress's page. To the fool. Why? How now, Captain? Why do you in this wise company? How dost thou, Apomantus? Would I had a rod in my mouth that I might answer thee profitably. For the Apomantus, read me the subscription of the superscription of these letters. I know not which is which. It's not read. No. There will little learning die then that day thou art hanged. This is to Lord Timon. This to Alcibiades. Go. Thou wast born a bastard, and thou die a bod. Thou wast wealth a dog, and thou shalt famish a dog's death. Answer not, I am gone. Exit. E'en so thou outrunnest grace. Fool, I will go with you to Lord Timon's. Will you leave me there? If Timon stay at home, you three serve three usurers. I would they served us. So would I. As good a trick as ever hangman served thief. Are you three usurers, men? Aye, fool. I think no usurer but has a fool to his servant. My mistress is one, and I am her fool. When men come to borrow of your theory, go away merry. But they enter my mistress's house merrily and go away sadly. The reason of this? Do it then that we may account thee a whoremaster and a knave, which notwithstanding thou shalt be no less esteemed. A fool in good clothes and something like thee. Tis a spirit, sometimes it appears like a lord, sometimes like a lawyer, sometimes like a philosopher, with two stones more than this artificial one. He is very often like a knight, and generally in all shapes that man goes up and down in some fourscore to thirteenth, the spirit walks in. Nor thou art altogether a wise man, as much foolery as I have, so much wit thou lackest. That answer might have become Apomantus. Aside, aside, here comes Lord Timon. Re-enter Timon and Flavius. Come with me, fool. Come. I do not always follow lover, elder brother, and woman. Sometimes the... Exeunt Epimantus, fool. Pray walk near, I'll speak with you anon. Exeunt servants. You make me marvel. Therefore, ere this time, had you not fully laid my state before me, that I might so have rated my expense as... I had leave of me. You would not hear me. At my leisure, leisures I proposed. No true. Chance some single vantages you took. And my indisposition put you back. And that inactness made your minister thus to excuse yourself. Oh, my good lord. At many times I brought in my accounts, laid them before you, and you would throw them off. Say so you found them in my honesty. But for some trifling present, you had bid me return so much, I shook, up, um, shook my head and wept, yet against the authority of manners prayed you to hold your hand close. I did endure, not seldom, nor no slight checks, when I had prompted you to the ebb and flow of your estate and your great flow of debts, my loved lord. Though you hear now, too late, yet now's a time, the greatest of your having lacks a half to pay your present debts. Let all my land be so. It is all engaged, some forfeited and gone, and what remains will hardly stop the mouth of present dues. The future comes apace. What shall, what shall, defer, de, term, what shall defend the interim and at length? How goes our reckoning? To lack a demon did my land extend. Oh. Good Lord, the world is but a word. Were it all yours to give in a breath, how quickly it were gone. You tell me true. If you suspect my husbandry or falsehood, call me before the exactest auditors and set me on a proof so the gods bless me when all our offices have been oppressed 
with riotous feeders. When our vaults have wept the drunken splice of wine, when every room hath blazoned with lights and braid with minstrelsy, I have retired me to a wasteful cock and mine eyes at flow. Prithee, no more. I have said the bounty of this Lord. How many prodigal bits have slaves and peasants this night in glutted? Who is not Timons? What heart, head, sword, force, means, but is Lord Timons? Great Timon, noble, worthy, royal Timon. Ah, when the means are gone, that by this praise the breath is gone, whereof this praise is made. Feast one, fast lost. One cloud of winter showers, these flies are couched. God, sermon me no further. No villainous bounty hath passed my heart. Unwisely, not unnobly, have I given. Why dost thou weep? Canst thou the conscience lack to think I shall lack friends? Secure thy heart. If I would broach the vessels of my love and try the argument of hearts by borrowing, men and men's fortunes could I frankly use as I can really speak. Assurance bless your thoughts. And in some sort, these wants of mine are crowned, that I count them blessings, for by these shall I try my friends. You shall perceive how you mistake my fortune. I am wealthy in my friends. Within there, Flaminius, Servilius. Enter Flaminius, Servilius, and other servants. My lord, my, my lord, lord, my lord. I will dispatch you severally. You to Lord Lucius, to Lord Lucullus, you. I hinted with his honour today. You, Sempronius, commend me to their lugs, and I am uh, proud, say, that my occasions have found time to use them toward a supply of money. Let the request be fifty talents. As you have said, my lord. Aside. Lord Lucilus and Lucullus, hmm? Go, you, sir, to the senators, of whom even to the state's best health I have deserved this hearing. Bid them send the instant a thousand talents to me. I have been bold. For that I knew it the most general way to them to use your signet and your name. But they do shake their heads, and I am here no richer in return. This true? They answer in a joint and corporate voice that now they are at a fall. Want treasure, cannot do what they could, are sorry, you're honorable, but they could have wished, they know not, something that hath been amiss, a noble nature, may catch a wretch, would all were well, tis pity. And so, intending other serious matters, and after distasteful looks, and these hard factions with certain half-caps and cold-moving nods, they froze me into silence. You, how to reward them? <laughs> Pretty man, look cheerily. These old fellows have their ingratitude in them hereditary. Their blood is caked, it is cold, it seldom flows. It is lack of kindly warmth, they are not kind. And nature, as it grows again toward earth, is fashioned for the journey. Oh, and heavy. To a servant. Go to Vendividius. To Flavius. Prithee, be not sad. Thou art true and honest. Ingeniously I speak. No blame belongs to thee. To servant. Ventidius lately buried his father, by whose death he stepped into a great estate. When he was poor, imprisoned, and in scarcity of friends, I cleared him with five talents. Greet him from me. Bid him suppose some good necessity touches his friend, which craves to be remembered with those five talents. Exit servants to Flavius. That had. I give it these fellows to whom tis instant due. Yes, speak or think the 
Timon's fortunes amongst his friends can sink. I would I could not think that thought is bounty's foe. Being free itself, it thinks all others so. Exeunt. Act three, scene one, a room in Lucius's house. Flaminius waiting, enter a servant to him. I have told my lord of you, he is coming down to you. I thank you, sir. Enter Lucius. Here's my lord. Aside. Lord Timon's men, a gift I warrant. Why, this hits right. I dreamt of a silver basin and you are tonight. Flaminius, honest Flaminius, you are very respectfully welcome, sir. Tell me some wine. Exit servants. And how does that honorable, complete, free-hearted gentleman of Athens, thy very bountiful good lord and master? His health is well, sir. I am right glad that his health is well, sir. And what hast thou there uh, under thy cloak, pretty Flaminius? Faith, nothing but an empty box, sir, which in my lord's behalf I come to entreat your honor to supply, who having great and instant occasion to use 50 talents, hath sent to your lordship to furnish him, nothing doubting your present assistance therein. <laughs> la, 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 la. Uh, nothing doubting, says he. Alas, good lord, a noble gentleman tis, if he would not keep so good a house. Uh, many a time and often I had dined with him and told him on it, and come again to supper to him, a purpose to have him spend less. And yet he would embrace no counsel, take no warning by my coming. Hmm. Every man has his fault and... <laughs> Honesty is his. I had told him on it, but I could ne'er get him from it. Re-enter servant with wine. Please, your lordship, here is the wine. Minius, I have noted thee always wise. Here's to thee. Your lordship speaks your pleasure. I have observed thee always for a towardly prompt spirit, give thee thy due, and one that knows what belongs to reason and canst use the time well, if the time use thee well, good parts in thee, get you gone, sirrah. Exit servant. Uh, on your honest Luminius, thy lord's a bountiful gentleman, but thou art wise, and thou knowest well enough although thou comest to me, that this is no time to lend money, especially upon bare friendship without security. Uh, here's three solid airs for thee. Good boy. Wink at me and say thou sawest me not. Fare thee well. Is it possible the world should so much differ and we alive that lived? Fly damned baseness to him that worships thee. Throwing the money back. Now I see, thou art a fool, and fit for thy master. Exit. May these add to the number that may scald thee. Let molten coin be thy damnation, thou disease of a friend, and not himself. Has friendship such a faint and milky heart? It, it turns in less than two nights. Oh, you gods, I feel master's passion. His slave unto his honor hath my lord's meat in him. Why should it thrive and turn to nutriment when he is turned to poison? Oh, may disease only work upon it. And when he's sick to death, let not that part of nature which my Lord paid for be of any power to expel sickness, but prolong his hour. Exit. Act three, scene two, a public place. Enter Lucilius with three strangers. Ooh, the he is my very good friend and an honorable gentleman. Now, we know him for no less, though we are but strangers to him. But I can tell you one thing, my lord, in which I hear from common rumors. Now Lord Timon's happy hours are done and past, and his estate shrinks from him. Fie, no, do not believe it. He cannot want for money. 
But believe you this, my Lord, that not long ago, one of his men was with the Lord, lustless to borrow so many talents, nay, urged extremely for it and showed what necessity belonged to it. And yet was denied. How? I tell you, denied, my Lord. What a strange case was that. Now, before the gods, I am ashamed on it. Denied that honorable man. There was very little honor showed in it. For my own part, I must needs confess. I have received some small kindness from him as money, plate, jewels, and such like trifles. Nothing comparing to his yet. Had he mistook him and sent to me, I should never have declined his occasion so many talents. Enter Servilius. See, my good hap, yonder my lord. I have sweat to see his honor, my honored lord. To Lucius. Servilius, you are kindly met, sir. Farewell, fare thee well. Commend me to thy honorable, virtuous lord, my very exquisite friend. May it please your honor, my lord has sent. Ha, what has he sent? I'm so much endeared to that lord, he's ever sending. How shall I thank him? Thankest thou? And what has he sent now? Has only sent his present occasion now, my lord, requesting your lordship to supply his instant use with so many talents. I know his lordship is but merry with me. He cannot want fifty hundred talents. But in the meantime, he wants less, my lord. If his occasion were not virtuous, I should not urge him to have so faithfully. Dost thou speak seriously, Servilius? Upon my soul, tis true, sir. What a wicked beast was I to disfurnish myself against such a good time, when I might have shown myself honorable. How unluckily it happened that I should purchase the day for a little part and undo a great deal of honored. Servilius, now, before the gods, I am not able to do. The more beast, I say, I was sending to use Lord Timon, myself, these gentlemen can witness, but I would not for the wealth of Athens I had done it now. Commend me bountifully to his good lordship, and I hope his honor will conceive the fairest of me, because I have no power to be kind, and tell him this from me. I count it one of my greatest afflictions, say that I cannot pleasure such an honorable gentleman. Good Servilius, will you befriend me so far as to use mine own words to him? Yes, sir, I shall. I'll look you out a good turn, Servilius. Exit Servilius. True, as you said, Timon is shrunk indeed, and he that's once denied will hardly speak. Exit. Do you observe this, Hostilius? Hey, too well. Why, this is the world's soul, and just of the same piece is every flatterer's spirit. Who can call him his friend that dips in the same dish? For in my knowing, Timon has been this lord's father, and kept his credit with his purse, supported his estate. Nay, Timon's money has paid his men their wages. He ne'er drinks, but Timon's silver treads upon his lip. And yet, oh, see the monstrousness of man when he looks out in an ungrateful shape. He does deny him, in respect of his, what charitable men afford to beggars. Religion groans at it. For mine own part, I never tasted Timon in my life, nor came of any of his bounties over me to mark me for his friend. Yet I protest, for his right noble mind, illustrious virtue, and honorable carriage, had his necessity made use of me, I would have put my wealth into donation, and the best half should have returned to him, so much I love his heart. But I perceive men must learn now with pity to dispense, for policy sits above conscience. Exeunt. Act three, scene three, a room in Sempronius's house. Enter Sempronius and a servant of Timon's.
Rachel. Must he needs trouble me, int? <laughs> Above all others? He might have tried Lord Lucius, or Lucullus, and now Ventidius is wealthy too, whom he redeemed from prison. All these owe their estates unto him. My lord, they have all been touched and found base metal, for they have uh, d denied him. How? Have they denied him? Has Ventidius and Lucullus denied him? And does he send to me three? <laughs> it shows but little love or judgment in him. Must I be his last refuge? His friends, like physicians, thrive, give him over. Must I take the cure upon me? Has much disgraced me in it. I'm angry at him. That might have known my place. I see no sense for it. But his occasion might have wooed me first. For in my conscience, I was the first man that e'er received gift from him. And does he think so backwardly of me now, that I'll requite its last? No. So it may prove an argument of laughter to the rest, and monks lords I be thought a fool. I'd rather than, the worth of thrice the sum, had sent to me first. But for my mind's sake, I'd such a courage to do him good. But now return, and with their faint reply this answer join. Who baits mine honor shall not know my coin. Exit. Excellent. Your lordship's a goodly villain. The devil knew not what he did when he made man politic. He crossed himself by tea. And I cannot think, but in the end, the villainies of man will set him clear. How fairly this lord strives to appear foul, takes virtuous copies to be wicked, like those that under hot ardent zeal would set Whole, whole realms on fire of such a nature is his politic love this was my lord's best hope now all are fled save only the gods now his friends are dead doors that were ne'er acquainted with their wards many a bounteous year must be employed now to guard sure their master and this is all a liberal course allows who cannot keep his wealth must keep his house. Exit. Act three, scene four. The same. A hall in Timon's house. Enter two servants of Varro and the servant of Lucius, meeting Titus, Hortentius, and other servants of Timon's creditors, waiting his coming out. Well met. Good morrow, Titus and Hortentius. Like to you, kind Varro. Oh, cheers. What do we do? We meet together. One business does command us all for mine is money. So is theirs and ours. Enter Philetus. Good day at once. What do you think the hour? Laboring for nine is not my lord seen yet? I wonder on it. He was wont to shine at seven. You must consider that a prodigal course is like the sun's, but not like his recoverable. I fear tis deepest winter in Lord Timon's purse. That is, one may reach deep enough and yet find a little. I am your fear for that. I'll show you how to observe a strange event. Your lord sends now for money. Most true, he does. And he wears jewels now of Timon's gift, for which I wait for money. It is against my heart, Timon, and this should pay more than he owes. And even as if your lord should wear rich jewels and send for money, money for him. I'm weary of this charge the gods can witness. I know my lord hath spent of Timon's wealth, and now in gratitude makes it worse than stealth. Yes, mine's three thousand crowns. What's yours? Tis much deep, and it should seem by the sun. Your master's confidence was above mine. Else, surely, his had equaled. Enter Flaminius. One of Lord Timon's men, come forth. No, indeed, he is not. We attend his lordship, pray, signify so much. I need not tell him that. He knows you are too diligent. Exit. Enter Flavius in a cloak, muffled. 
He goes away in a cloud. Call him. Call him. Do you hear, sir? By your leave, sir. What do you ask of me, my friend? We wait for certain money here, sir. Aye. If money were as certain as you're waiting, for sure enough. Why then prefer you not your sums and bills when you false masters eat of my lord's meat? Then they could smile and fawn upon his debts and take down their interest into their gluttonous maw. You do yourselves but wrong to stir me up. Let me pass quietly. Believe it, my lord and I have made an end. I have no more to reckon he to spend. If twere not serve, tis no so base as you, but you serve knaves. Exit. Ow. What does his cashiered worship mutter? No matter what, he's poor, and that's revenge enough. Who can speak broader than he that has no house to put his head on? Such may rail against great buildings. Enter Servilius. Oh, here's Servilius. Now we shall know some answer. <clears throat> if I might beseech you, gentlemen, to repair, to repair some other hour, I should derive much from it. For ticket of my soul, my lord leans wondrously to d discontent. His comfortable temper has forsook him. He's much out of health and keeps his chamber. And if it be so far beyond his health, he thinks he should the sooner pay his debts and make a, cl a clear way to the gods. Uh, good gods. We cannot take this for an answer, sir. Within. Enter Timon in a rage, Flaminius following. But are my doors opposed against my passage? Have I been ever free, and must my house be my retentive enemy, my goal? The place which I have feasted, does it now, like all mankind, show me an iron heart? My lord, here is my bill. And mine, my lord. All our bills. Knock me down with them. Lead me to the girdle. Cut my heart in sums. Mine, fifty talents. Tell out my blood. Five thousand drops plays that. But yours, and yours. My lord. My lord. Tear me, take me, and the gods fall upon you. Exit. Faith, I perceive our masters may throw their caps at their money. These debts may well be called desperate ones, <laughs> for a madman owes them. Exeunt. Re-enter Timon and Flavius. They have even put my breath from me. Slaves. Predators. Generals. My dear lord. What if it should be so? My lord. I'll have it so. My steward. If he or my lord. No fitly. No. Did all my friends again. Lucius, Lucullus, and Sempronius, all, Sarah, all, I'll once more feast the rascals. Oh, my lord, you only speak from your distracted soul. There's not so much left to furnish out a moderate table. Be not that in thy care. No, I charge thee, invite them all. Let in the tide of knaves once more. My cook and I'll provide. Exeunt. We will now take a brief five minute intermission.
Welcome back to the International Shakespeare Players reading of Timon of Athens. We will now continue with Act 3, Scene 5. Act 3, Scene 5. The same. The Senate House. The Senate sitting. My lord, you have my voice to it. The fault's bloody. Tis necessary he should die. Nothing emboldens sin so much as mercy. Most true. The law shall bruise him. Enter Alcibiades with attendance. Honor, health, and compassion to the Senate. Now, Captain? I am an humble suitor to your virtues, for pity is the virtue of the law, and none but tyrants use it cruelly. It pleases time and fortune to lie heavy upon a friend of mine who in hot blood hath stepped into the law, which is past depth to those that without heed do plunge into it. He is a man setting his fate aside of comely virtues, nor did he soil the fact with cowardice an honor in him which buys out his fault, but with a noble fury and fair spirit, seeing his reputation touched to death, he did oppose his foe. And with such sober and unnoted passion, he did behave his anger, ere twas spent, as if he had but proved an argument. You undergo to strict a paradox, striving to make an ugly deed look fair. Your words have took such pains as if they'd labored to bring manslaughter into form and set quarreling into the head of valor which indeed is valor misbegot and came into the world when sex and factions were newly born. He's truly valiant that can wisely suffer the worst that man can breathe <laughs> and make his wrongs his outsides to wear them like his raiment carelessly and ne'er prefer his injuries to his heart to bring it into danger. If wrongs be evils and enforce us kill, what folly it is hazard life for ill. My Lord, I... What cannot make gross sins look clear? To revenge is no valor, but to bear. My lords, then, under favor, pardon me if I speak like a captain. Why do fond men expose themselves to battle and not endure all threats? Sleep upon it, and let the foes quietly cut their throats without repugnancy. If there be such valor in the bearing, what make me what what make we abroad? Why then women are more valiant that stay at home, if bearing carry it, and the ass more captain than the lion, the felon loaded with irons wiser than the judge, if wisdom be in suffering. Oh my lords, as you are great, be pitifully good. Who cannot condemn rashness and cold blood? To kill, I grant, is sin's extremest gust. But in defense, by mercy, tis most just. To be in anger is impiety, but who is man that is not angry? Weigh but the crime with this. You breathe in vain. In vain? His service done at Lacer Damon and Byzantium were a sufficient briber for his life. What's that? I say, my lords, he has done fair service and slain in fight many of your enemies. How full of valor did he bear himself in the last conflict and made his plenteous wounds? Well, he has made too much plenty with them. He's a sworn rioter. He has a sin that often drowns him and takes his valor prisoner. If there were no foes, that were enough to overcome him. And that beastly fury he has been known to commit outrages and cherish factions. She's inferred to us his days are foul and his drink dangerous. He dies. But hard fate! He might have died in war. My lords, if not for any parts in him, though his right arm might purchase his own time and be in debt to none, yet more to move you, take my deserts to his and and join them both. And for I know your reverent age's love security, I'll pawn my victories, all my honors to you upon his good returns. If by this crime he owes the law his life, why let the war receive it in valiant gore for, for law is strict and war is nothing more. We are for law. He dies, urge it no more. 
on height of our displeasure, friend or brother, he forbid he forfeits his own blood that spills another. Must it be so? It must not be. My lords, I do beseech you. You know me. How? Call me to your remembrances. What? I, I cannot think, but your age has forgot me. It, it could be, could not else be. I should prove so base to sue and be denied such common grace. My wounds ache at you. Do you dare our anger? Tis in few words, but spacious in effect. We banish thee forever. Banish me? Banish your dotage, banish usury that makes the Senate ugly. If after two days shine, Athens contain thee, attend our weightier judgment. And not to swell our spirit, he shall be executed presently. Exeunt Senators. Now the gods keep you old enough that you may live only in bone, that none may look on, on you. I'm worse than mad. I have kept back their foes while they have told their money and let out their coin upon large interest. I myself rich only in large hurts. All those for this? Is this the balsam that the usuring senate pours into captain's wounds? Banishment? It comes not ill. I have not to be banished. It is a cause worthy my spleen and fury that I may strike at Athens. I'll cheer up my discontented troops and lay for hearts. Tis honor with most lands to be at odds. Soldiers should brook at little wrongs as gods. Exit. Act three, scene six, the same. A banqueting room in Timon's house. Music, tables set out, servants attending. Enter diverse lords, senators, and others at several doors. A good time of day to you, sir. I also wish it to you. I think this honorable lord did but try us this other day. Upon that were my thoughts tiring. When we were encountered, I hope it is not so low with, with him as he made it seem in the trial of his several friends. It should not be by the persuasion of his new feasting. I should think so. He hath sent me an earnest inviting, which many my near occasions did urge me to put off. But he hath conjured me before them, and I must needs appear. In like manner was I in debt to my importunate business, but he would not hear my excuse. I am sorry when he sent to borrow of me that my provision was out. I am sick of that grief, too, as I understand how all things go. Every man hears so. What would he have borrowed of you? A thousand pieces. A thousand pieces! What of you? He sent to me, sir. Here he comes. Enter Timon and attendants. With all my heart, gentlemen both, and how fare you? Ever at the best, hearing well of your lordship. The swallow follows not summer more willing than we, your lordship. Nor more willingly leaves winter such summer birds are men. Gentlemen, our dinner will not recompense this long stay. Feast your ears with the music a while if they will fare so harshly the trumpet sound. We shall to it presently. I hope it remains not unkindly with your lordship that I returned you an empty messenger. Oh, sir, let it not trouble you. My noble lord. Ah, my good friend, what cheer? My most honorable lord, I am even sick of shame that... When your lordship this other day sent to me, I was so unfortunate a beggar. Think not, aunt, sir. If you had sent but two hours before. Let it not come by your better remembrance. The banquet brought in. Come, bring in all together. All covered dishes. Royal cheer, I warrant you. Doubt not that, if money and season can yield it. How do you? What's the news? Alcibiades is banished. Hear you of it? With second lord. Alcibiades banished? Tis so. Be sure of it. How? How? Pray you upon what? My worthy friends, will you draw near? I'll tell you more anon. 
Here's a noble feast toward. This is the old man still. Will it hold? Will it hold? It does, but time will. And so... I do conceive. Each man to his stool with that spur as he would to the lip of his mistress. Your diet shall be in all places alike. Make not a city feast of it to let the meat cool ere we can agree upon the first place. Sit! Sit! The gods require our thanks. You great benefactors, sprinkle our society with thankfulness. For your own gifts, make yourselves praise. But reserve still to give, lest your deities be despised. Lend to each man enough, that one then needs not lend to another. For were your godheads to borrow of men, men would forsake the gods. Make the meat be beloved more than the man that gives it. Let no assembly of twenty be without a score of villains. If there be uh, twelve women at the table, let a dozen of them be as they are. The rest of your fees, O gods, the senators of Athens, together with the common lag of people, what is amiss in them, you gods, make suitable for destruction. For these, my present friends, as they are to me nothing, so in nothing bless them, and to nothing they are welcome. Uncover, dogs, and laugh! The dishes are uncovered and seem to be full of warm water. What does his lordship mean? No, not. May you a better feast never behold, you knot of mouth friends. Smoke and lukewarm water is your perfection. This is Timon's last, who stuck and spangled with your flatteries, washes it off and sprinkles it in your faces, you reeking villainy. Throwing the water in their faces. Live loathed and long, most smiling, smooth, detested, Parasites, courteous destroyers, affable wolves, meek bears, you fools of fortune, trencher friends, times, flies, cap and knee flames, vapors and minute jacks. Of man and beast, the infinite malady crushed you quite all. What? Dost thou go? Soft, take thy physic first. And thou, and thou, stay, I will lend thee money. Oh, no, no. Throws the dishes at them and drives them out. What? All in motion? Hence be no feast whereat a villain's not a welcome guest. Burn house. Sink, Athens. Henceforth hated be of time and man and all humanity. Exit. Re-enter the lords, senators, and company. How now, my lords? Know you the quality of Lord Timon's fury? Hush, did you see my cap? I have lost my gown. He's but a mad lord, and naught but humor sways him. He gave me a jewel the other day, and now he has beat it out of my hat. Did you see my jewel? Did you see my cap? Here it is. Here lies my gown. Let's make no stay. Lord Timon's mad. I feel it upon my bones. One day he gives us diamonds, next day stones. Exeunt. Act four, scene one. Without the walls of Athens. Enter Timon. Let me look back upon thee. Oh, thy wall that girdest in those wolves. I've in the earth and fence not Athens. Patrons, turn incontinent. Obedience fail in children. Slaves and fools pluck the grave wrinkled senate from the bench and minister in their steads. The general filths convert to the instant green virginity. Do it in your parents' eyes. 
bankrupt. Hold fast, rather than render back, out with your knives and cut your custer's throats. Bound servants steal. Large-handed robbers your grave masters are and kill by law. Made to thy master's bed, thy mistress is of the brothel. Son of sixteen, pluck the lined crutch from thy old limping sire. With it, beat out his brains. Piety and fear, religion to the gods, peace, justice, truth, domestic awe, night rest and neighbourhood, instruction, manners, mysteries and trades, degrees, observances, customs and laws, decline to your confounding contraries, and let confusion live. Plagues, incident to men, your potent and infectious fevers, heap on Athens, ripe for stroke. Thou cold sciatica, cripple our senators, that their limbs may halt as lamely as their manners. Lust and liberty creep in the minds and marrows of our youth. Against the stream of virtue they may strive and drown themselves in riot. Riches, blains, sow all the Athenian bosoms, and their crop be general leprosy. Breath infect breath at their society, as their friendship may merely poison. Nothing I'll bear from thee. But nakedness, thou detestable town, take thou that too with multiplying bands, time and will to the woods, where he shall find the unkindliest beast more kinder than mankind. The gods confound, hear me, you good gods all, the Athenians both within and out that wall, and grant as Timon grows, his hate may grow to the whole race of mankind, high and low. Amen. Exit. Act 4, Scene 2. Athens. A room in Timon's house. Enter Flavius with two or three servants. Hear you, master steward. Where is our master? Are we undone? Cast off? Nothing remaining? Lack, my fellows, what should I say to you? Let me be recorded by the righteous gods. I am as poor as you. Such a house broke. So noble a master fallen in. All gone. And not one friend to take his misfortune by the arm and go along with him? As we do turn our backs from our companion thrown into his grave, so his familiars to his buried fortune slink all away, leaving their false vows with him like empty purses picked, and his poor self, a dedicated beggar to the air, with his disease of all shunned poverty, walks like contempt alone. More of our fellows. Enter other servants. O oh, broken implements of a ruined house. Yet do our hearts wear Thomas livery. That see how by our faces we are fellows still. Serving alike in sorrow, leet is our bark. And we, poor mates, stand on the dying deck. Hearing the surge's threat, we must all part into this sea of air. Good fellows all, and latest of my wealth, I'll share amongst you. Whenever we shall meet, for time and sake. Let's yet be fellows. Let's shake our heads and say, as to our knell and to our master's fortunes, we have seen better days. Let's each take some. Nay, hey, put out your hands. Not one word more. Thus we part, we thus part we rich in sorrow, parting poor. Servants embrace and part several ways. For the fierce wretchedness that glory brings us. Who would not wish to be from wealth exempt, since riches point to misery and contempt? Who would be so mocked with glory or to live but in a dream of friendship? 
of his pomp and all what state compounds, but only painted like his varnished friends. Poor honest Lord, brought low by his own heart, undone by goodness, strange, unusual blood, when man's worst sin is he does too much good. Who then dares to be half so kind again? For bounty that makes gods still doth mar men. My dearest Lord, blessed to be most accursed, rich, only to be wretched, thy great fortunes are made, thy chief afflictions. Alas, kind Lord, is flung in rage from this ingrateful seat of monstrous friends, nor has he with him to supply his life or that which he can command it. I'll follow and inquire him out. I'll ever serve his mind with my best will. Whilst I have gold, I'll be his steward still. Exit. Act four, scene three. Woods and cave near the seashore. Enter Timon from the cave. Oh, blessed breeding sun, draw from the earth rotten humility. Below thy sister's orb, infect the air. Twin brothers of one womb whose procreation, residence and birth scarce is dividend, touch them with several fortunes. The greater scorns the lesser, but nature, to whom all sores lay siege, can bear great fortune, but by contempt of nature. Raise me this beggar and deny it that lord. The senator shall bear contempt hereditary. The beggar, native honour. It is the pasture lards, the rother's sides, the one that makes him lean. Who dares, who dares in purity of manhood stand upright and say, this man's a flatterer. If one be, so are they all. For every grise of fortune, is smoothed by that below. Learned hate ducks to the golden fool. All is a bleak. There's nothing level in our cursed natures but direct villainy. Therefore be aboard all feasts, societies, and throngs of men. His semblable, yea, himself, Hymen, disdains. Destruction fang mankind. Earth, yield me roots. Digging. Who seeks for better of these, source his palate with the most operant poison. What's here? Oh, yellow. Glittering, precious gold. No, God, I am no idle votarist. Roots, you clear heavens. This much of this will make black, white, foul, fair, right, wrong, base, noble, old, young, coward, valiant. How are you, gods? Why this? What this, you gods? Why? This will lug your priests and servants from your sides, pluck stout men's pillows from beyond below their heads. This yellow slave will knit and break religions, bless the accursed, make the whore leprosy adored, place thieves and give them title knee and approbation with senators on the bench. This it is that makes the wappen widow wed again. She whom would the spittle house and ultra sores would cast the gorge at, this embalmed and spices to that April day again. Come, damned earth, thou common whore of mankind that puts odds amongst the root of nations. I will make thee do thy right nature. March afar off. Huh. A drum. Ah, 
quick! <laughs> and yet I'll bury thee! Thou go, strong thief, when gouty keepers of thee cannot stand nay! Stand thou out for earnest! Keeping some gold, enter Alcibiades with drum and fife in warlike manner, Phrynia and Tamandra. What art thou there? Speak! A beast as thou art! Anchor nor my heart for showing me again the eyes of man. What is thy name? Is man so hateful to thee that art thyself a man? I am misanthropos, and hate mankind. For thy part I do wish thou wert a dog, that I might love thee something. I know thee well. But in thy fortunes I am unlearned and strange. I know thee too, and more than that I know thee, I not desire to know. Follow thy drum, with man's blood, paint the ground. Fools, fools, religious canons, civil laws are cruel, then what should war be? This fell whore of thine hath in her more destruction than thy sword, for all her cherubim look. Thy lips rot off. I will not kiss thee, and the rot returns to thine own lips again. But how came the noble time into this change? Ah, uh, as the moon does, I wanting light to give. But then renew I could not. Like the moon, there were no sons to borrow of. Noble Timon, what friendship may I do thee? None, but to maintain my opinion. What is it, Timon? Promise me friendship, but perform none. If thou wilt not promise, the gods plague thee, for thou art a man. If thou dost perform, confound thee, for thou art a man. I have heard in some sort of thy miseries. Thou sawest them when I had prosperity. But I, I see them now. Then was a blessed time. As thine is now, held with a brace of harlots. Is this the Athenian minion, whom the world voiced so regardfully? Art thou Timandra? Yes. Be a whore still. They love thee not, but use thee. Give them diseases, leaving with thee their lust. Make use of their thy salt hours. Season the slaves for tubs and baths. Bring down rose-cheeked youths to the tub fast and the diet. Hang thee, monster. Pardon him, sweet Timandra. For his wits are drowned and lost in his calamities. I have but little gold of late, brave Timon. The want whereof doth daily make revolt in my penurious band. I have heard and grieved how cursed Athens, mindless of thy worth, forgetting thy great deeds when neighboring states, but for thy sword and fortune, trod upon them. I pray thee, beat thy drum and get thee gone. I am thy friend, and pity thee, dear Timon. How dost thou pity him whom thou dost trouble? I'd rather be alone. Why, fare thee well. Here is some gold for thee. Keep it, I cannot eat it. When I have laid proud Athens on a heap, I... Wast thou against Athens? Aye, Timon, and have cause. The gods confound them all in thy conquest. And thee after, when thou hast conquered. Why me, Timon? That by killing of villains thou wast born to conquer my country. Put up thy gold, go on, here's gold. Go on. Here's a planetary plague, when Jove will o'er some high-viced city hang his poison in the sick air. Let not thy sword skip one. Pity not honoured age for his white beard, he is a usurer. Strike me the counterfeit matron, it is her habit only that is honest, herself's abhorred. Let not the virgin's cheek make soft thy trenchant sword, for those milk taps that through the window bars bore at men's eyes are not within the leaf of 
mighty writ, but set them down, horrible traitors. Spare not the babe, whose dimpled smiles from fools exhaust their mercy. Think it a bastard, whom the oracle hath doubtfully pronounced, thy throat shall cut and mince it sans remorse. Swear against objects. Put armour in thine eyes and on thine ears, whose proof nor yells of mothers, maids, nor babes, nor sight of priests in holy vestments bleeding shall pierce a jot. There's gold to pay soldiers. Make large confusion, and thy fury spent, confounded be thyself. Speak not, be gone. Hast thou gold yet? I'll take the gold thou givest me, not all thy counsel. Dost thou or dost thou not heaven's curse upon thee? Give us some gold, good time, and hast thou more? Oh, enough, and enough to make a whore for swayed her trade, and to make whores aboard. Hold up, you sluts, your aprons mounted. You are not oathable. Although I know you'll swear, terribly swear into strong shudders, and to heaven the agues, the immortal gods that hear you, spare your oaths, I'll trust to your conditions, be whore still, and he whose pious breath seeks to convert you, be strong in whore, lure him, burn him up, let your close fire predominate his smoke, and be no turncoats, yet may your brain six months be quite contrary, and thatch your poor thin roofs with burdens of the dead. Some that were hanged, no matter, wear them, betray with them, poor still, paint, till a horse may mire upon your face a box of wrinkles. Well, more gold, what then? Believe it. That will do anything for gold. Consumption so in hollow bones of man. Strike their sharp shins and mar men's spurring. Crack the lawyer's voice that he may never more false title plead, nor sound his credit shrilly. Or the flamen that scolds against the quality of flesh and not believes himself. Down with the nose, down with the flat, take the bridge quite away of him that is particular to foresee smells from the general wheel. Make early paint ruffians bold, and let the unscarred braggarts of the war derive some pain from you. Plague all, that your activity may defeat and quell the source of all erection. There's more gold. You damn others and let this damn you and ditches brave you all. More counsel with more money, bounteous time. And... More whore, more mischief first. I have given you earnest. Strike up the drums towards Athens. Farewell, Timon. If I thrive well, I'll visit thee again. If I hope well, I'll never see thee more. I never did thee harm. Yes, thou spokes well of me. Callest thou that harm? Men daily find it. Get thee away and take thy beagles with thee. We but offend him. Strike! Drum beats. Exeunt, Alcibiades, Phrynia, and Tamandra. That nature, being sick of man's unkindness, should yet be hungry. Come, mother, thou whose womb unmeasurable and infinite breast teems and feeds all, whose self-same metal whereof thy pride child arrogant man is puffed, engenders the black toad and adder blue and gilded newt and eyeless venomed worm with all the abhorred births below crisp heaven, whereon Hyperion's quickening fire doth shine, yield him who all thy human sons doth hate, from forth thy plenteous bosom, one poor brute. 
Consider thy fertile and conceptuous womb, let it no more bring out ingrateful man. Though great with tigers, dragons, wolves, and bears, teem with new monsters whom thy upward face hath to the marble's mansion all above never presented. Oh! A root! Dear thanks. Dry up thy marrows, vines, and Found torn lees whereof ungrateful man with licorice draughts and morsels anxious greases his poor mind that from it all consideration slips. Enter Epimantus. More man. Play. Play. I was directed hither. Men report thou dost affect my manners and dost use them. Is then because thou dost not keep a dog who I would imitate? Consumption, catch thee! This is in thee a nature but infected, a poor unmanly melancholy sprung from change of fortune. Why this spade, this place, this slave like habit, and these looks of care? Thy flatterers yet wear silk, drink wine, lie soft, hug their diseased perfumes, and have forgot that ever time in was. Shame not these woods by putting on the cunning of a carper. Be thou a flatterer now and seek to thrive by that which has undone thee. Hinge thy knee and let this very breath whom thou wilt observe blow off thy cap. Praise his most vicious strain and call it excellent. Thou wast told thus, thou gavest thine ears like tapsters that bid welcome to knaves and all approachers. Tis most just that thou turn rascal. Hadst thou wealth again? Rascal should have it. Do not assume my likeness. <laughs> when I like thee, I'd throw away myself. Thou hast cast away thyself, being like thyself. A madman so long, now a fool. What, thinks that the bleak air, thy boisterous chamberlain, will put thy shirt on warm? For these moss trees that have outlived the eagle, page thy heels and skip where thou point'st out? Will the cold brook, candied with ice, coddle thy morning taste? to cure thy o'ernight surfeit. Call the creatures whose naked natures live in, in the spite of reekful heaven, whose bare unhoused trunks to the conflicting elements exposed answer mere nature. Bid them flatter thee, O oh, thou shalt find. O oh, fool of thee, depart! I love thee better now than I e'er did. I hate thee worse. Why? Thou flatterest misery. I flatter not, but say thou art a caitiff. Why dost thou seek me out? To vex thee. Always a villain's office or a fool's. Dost please thyself in? Aye. What? A knave, too? If thou didst put this sour cold habit on to castigate thy pride, twere well, but thou does it enforcedly. Thou'd courtier be again, wert thou not beggar. Willing misery outlives and certain pomp is crowned before. The one is filling still, never complete. The other at high wish. Best state, contentless, hath a distracted and most wretched being, worse than the worst, content. Thou shouldst desire to die being miserable. Not by this breath that is more miserable. Thou art a slave, whom fortune's tender arm with favour never clasped. A bred a dog. Hast thou, like us, from our first swath, preceded the sweet degrees that his brief world affords to such as may the passive drugs of it freely command, thou wouldst have plunged thyself in general riot, melted down thy youth in different beds of lust, and never learned the icy precepts of respect that followed the sugared game before thee. But myself, who had the world as my confectionery, the mouths, the tongues, the eyes and hearts of men at duty, more than I could frame employment, that numberless upon me stuck as leaves do on the oak, hive with one winter's brush, fell from their boughs, and left me open, bare, for every storm that blows. I prepare this 
never knew before is some person. My nature did commence in sufferance. Time hath made thee hard in it. Why shouldst thou hate men? They never flattered thee. What hast thou given? If thou wilt curse, thy father, that poor rag, must be thy subject, who in spite took stuff to some she-beggar and compounded thee, poor rogue hereditary. Hence be gone, if thou hast not been born the worst of men, thou hast been a knave and flatterer. Art thou proud yet? Aye, but I am not thee. Aye, that I was no prodigal. I, that I am one now, where all the wealth I have shut up in thee, I'd give thee to hang it, get thee gone, that the whole life of Athens were in this dust when I eat it. <gasps> Here, I will mend thy feast. Offering him a root. First mend my company. Take away thyself. So I shall mend mine own by the lack of thine. It is not well mended so, but is but botched. If not, I would it were. What wouldst thou have to Athens? Thee, thither, in a whirlwind. If thou wilt, tell them there I have gold. Look, so I have. There is no use for gold. The best and truest, for here it sleeps and does no hired harm. Where liest a night's time in? Under that above me? Where feedst thou a day's Epimanthus? Where my stomach finds meat, or rather where I eat it. Would poison were obedient, and knew my mind. Where wouldst thou send it? To source thy dishes. The middle of humanity thou never knewest but the extremity of both ends. When thou wast in thy guilt and thy perfume, they mocked thee for too much curiosity. In thy rags thou knowest none, but art despised for the contrary. There's a meddler for thee. Eat it. On what I hate, I feed not. Dost hate a meddler? Aye, but it looked like thee. And thou hadst hated meddlers sooner, thou shouldst have loved thyself better now. What man didst thou ever know unthrift that was beloved after his means? Who, without those means thou talkst of, didst thou ever know beloved? Myself. I understand thee. I had some means to keep a dog. What things in the world canst thou nearest compare to thy flatterers? Women nearest. But men, men are the things themselves. What wouldst thou do with the world, Apermantus, if it lay in thy power? Give it the beasts to be rid of the men. Wouldst thou have thyself fall in the confusion of men and remain a beast with the beasts? Aye, Timon. A beastly ambition which the gods grant thee pain to. <laughs> if thou wert the lion, the fox would beguile thee. If thou wert the lamb, the fox would eat thee. If thou wert the fox, the lion would suspect thee when peradventure you wert accused by the ass. If thou wert the ass, thy dullness would torment thee, and still thou livedst but as a breakfast to the wolf. If thou wert the wolf, thy greediness would afflict thee, and oft thou shouldst Hazard thy life for thy dinner. Wert thou the unicorn, pride and wrath would confound thee and make thine own self the conquest of thy fury. Wert thou a bear, thou wouldst be killed by the horse. Wert thou a horse, thou wouldst be seized by the leopard. Wert thou the leopard, thou wert German to the lion, and the spots of thy kindred were jurors on thy life. All thy safety were remotion and thy defence absence. What beast couldst thou be 
that were not subject to a beast. And what a beast art thou already that sees not thy loss in transformation? If thou couldst please me with speaking to me, thou mightst have hit upon it here. The commonwealth of Athens is become a forest of beasts. How has the ass broke the wall that thou art out of the city? Yonder comes a poet and a painter. The plague of company light upon thee. I will fear to catch it and give way. When I know not what else to do, I'll see thee again. And there is nothing living but thee. Thou shalt be welcome. I had rather be a beggar's dog than Athenanthus. Thou art the cap of all of fools alive. But thou wert clean enough to spit upon. A plague on thee. Thou art too bad to curse. All villains that do stand by thee are pure. There is no leprosy but what thou speakest. If I name thee, I'll beat thee, but I should infect my hands. I would my tongue could rot them off. Away, thou issue of a mangy dog. Follow us kill me that thou art alive. I swoon to see thee. Would thou wouldst burst. Away, thou tedious rogue. I'm surely I shall lose a stone by thee. Throws a stone at him. Beast. Slave. Toad. Dog. 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 I am sick of this false world. And will love not even the mere necessities upon it. Then, Timon, presently, prepare thy grave. Lie where the light foam the sea may beat thy gravestone daily. Make thine epitaph that death in me that others' lives may laugh. To the gold. Oh, thou sweet king colour and a divorce twixt natural son and sire. How bright defiler of Hymen's purest bed. How valiant Mars, how ever young, fresh, loved and delicate wooer, whose bust doth thaw the consecrated snow that lies on Dian's lap, thou visible god that Soldrest close impossibilities and makes them kiss. It speaks with every tongue, to every purpose. Oh, thou touch of hearts. Think thy slave man rebels and by thy virtue set them into confounding odds. That beasts may have the world in empire. Would it were so, but not till I am dead. I'll say thou'st gold, thou wilt be thronged to shortly. Thronged to? Aye. Thy back, I prithee. Live and love thy misery. Long live so and so die. Exit Apamantus. I am quit. No things like men. Each time and then abhor them. Enter banditti. Where should he have this gold? It is some poor fragment, some slender sort of his remainder, the mere want of gold and the failing from his from of his friends drove him into this melancholy. It is noised he hath a mass of treasure. Let us make the essay upon him. If he care not for it, he will supply us easily. If he covetously reserve it, how shall get it? True, for he bears it not about him. Tis hid. Is not this he? Where? He, I know him. He, I know him. Save thee, Timon. Ah. Thieves. Soldiers, not thieves. Both two, and women's sons. We are not thieves, but men that much do want. Your greatest want is you want much of meat. Why should you want? Hold the earth had roots. Within this mile, forth 
a hundred springs. The oaks bear mast, the briars scarlet hips. The bounteous housewife nature on each bush lays her full mess before you. Want? I want? Cannot live on grass, on berries, water, as beasts and birds and fishes. Nor on the beasts themselves, the birds and fishes. You must eat men. Yet thanks I must you con that you are thieves professed, that you work not in holier shapes, for there is boundless theft in limited professions. Rascal thieves, his gold. Go oh, suck the subtle blood of the grape till the high fever seethe your blood to froth and so scape hanging. Trust not the physician, his antidotes are poison. And he slays more than you rob. Take wealth and lives together. You villainy do, since you protest you do it, like workmen. I'll example you with thievery. The son's a thief, and with his great attraction, robs the vast sea. The moon's an arrant thief, and her pale fire she snatches from the sun. The sea's a thief, whose liquid surge resolves the moon into salt tears. The earth's a thief that feeds and breeds by a composture stolen from general excrement. Each thing's a thief. The laws, your curb and whip, in their rough power, have unchecked theft. Love not yourselves. Away, rob one another. There's more gold. Cut throats. All that you meet are thieves. To Athens go, break open shops. Nothing you can steal, but thieves do lose it. Steal no less for this I give you, and gold confound you, howsoe'er. Amen. It has almost charmed me from my profession by persuading me to it. It is in the malice of mankind that he thus advises us not to have us thrive in our mystery. Believe him as an enemy and give over my trade. Let us first see peace in Athens. There is no time so miserable but a man may be true. Exeunt banditti. Enter Flavius. Oh, you gods. Is yon despised and ruinous man, my lord, full of decay and failing, O oh, monument, and wonder of good deeds evilly bestowed. What an alteration of honor is disparate want made. What viler thing upon the earth than friends? Who can bring noblest minds to base ends? How rarely does it meet with this time's guise when man was wished to love his enemies. Grant I may ever love and rather woo than those that would mischief me than those that do. He has caught me in his eye. I will present my honest grief unto him and as my Lord, still serve him with my life. My dearest master. Away! Have you forgotten me, sir? Why dost thou ask? I have forgotten all men and if you grant us thou art a man, I have forgot thee. An honest poor servant of yours. Then I know thee not. I never had an honest man about thee. I, all I kept were knaves to serve in meat to villains. The gods are witness. Never did poor Stuart wear truer grief for his undone lord than mine eyes for you. What? Dost thou weep? Come nearer then I love thee, because thou art a woman, and this clenched, flinty mankind, whose eyes do never give but thorough lust and laughter. It is sleeping, strange times, that weep with laughing, not with weeping. I beg of you to know me, 
good my lord, to accept my grief, and whilst this poor wealth lasts, to entertain me as your steward still. Had I a steward so true, so just, and now so comfortable? Hmm. Almost turns my dangerous nature mild. Let me behold thy face. Surely this man was born a woman. Forgive my general and acceptless harshness, you perpetual sober gods. I do proclaim one honest man. Mistake me not, but one. No more, I pray. And he's a steward. How fain would I have hated all mankind, and thou redeemst thyself. But all, save thee, I fell with curses. He thinks thou art more honest now than wise, for by oppressing and betraying me, I might have got sooner another service. For many so arrive at second masters upon their first lord's neck. But tell me true, for I must ever doubt, though ne'er so sure, is not thy kindness subtle, covetous, if not using a usuring kindness, and as rich men deal gifts, expecting in return twenty for one? No, oh, my most worthy master, in whose breast doubt and suspect, alas, are placed too late. You should have feared false times when you did feast. Suspect still comes when an estate is leased. That which I show heaven knows is merely love, duty and zeal to your unmatched mind. Care of your food and living and believe it, my most honored Lord, for any benefit that points to me, either in hope or present, out of the exchange. For this one wish that you had power and wealth to requite me by making rich yourself. Look there. Is so a singly honest man? Here, take the gods out of thy misery, have sent thee treasure. Go live rich and happy. But this condition thou shalt kill from men. Hate all, curse all, show charity to none, but let the famished flesh slide from the bone ere you relieve the beggar. Give to dogs what thou deniest to men, let prisons swallow them, let wither them to nothing, be men like blasted woods, and may diseases lick up their false bloods. And so farewell, and thrive. Let me stay comfort you, my master. If thou hates curses, stay not. Fly while thou art blessed and free. Ne'er see thou man, and let me ne'er see thee. Exit Flavius. Timon retires to his cave. Act 5, Scene 1. The Woods, before Timon's cave. Enter poet and painter, Timon watching them from his cave. As I took note of the place, it cannot be far where he abides. What's to be thought of him? Does the rumor hold for true that he's so full of gold? Certain. Achilliades reports it. Phrynia and Timandra had gold of him. He likewise enriched poor strutting shoulders with great quantity. It is said he gave unto his steward a mighty sum. The misbreaking of him has been but a try for his friends. Nothing else. You shall see him a palm in Athens again and flourish with the highest. Therefore, it is not amiss we tender our loves to him in this supposed distress of his. It will show honestly in us and is very likely to load our purposes with what will they travail for, if it be a just true report that goes of his having. Well, what have you now to present unto him? Nothing at this time but my visitation. Only I will promise him an excellent peace. I must serve him so too. Tell him of an intent that's coming toward him. Good as the best. 
promising is the very air of the time. It opens the eyes of expectation. Performance is ever the dollar for his art, and, but in the plainer and simpler kind of people, the deed of saying is quite out of use. <laughs> to promise is most courtly and fashionable. Performance is a kind of real or testament which argues a great sickness in his judgment that makes it. Timon comes from his cave behind. Aside. Excellent workman, thou canst not paint a man so bad as is thyself. I am thinking what I shall say I have provided for him. It must be a personating of himself, a satire against the softness of prosperity with the discovery of the infinite flatteries that follow youth and opulency. Must thou need stand for a villain in thine own work? Wilt thou whip thine own faults in other men? Do so. I have gold for thee. Nay, let's seek him. Then do we sin against our own estate when we may profit meet and come too late. True. When the day serves before black corn at night, find what thou wants by free and awful light. Come. Aside. I'll meet you at the turn. What of God's gold that he is worshipped in a baser temple than where swine feed? It is thou that rigs the bark and plows the foam, settlest admired reverent in a slave. For thee be worship, and thy saints for I be crowned with plagues that thee alone obey. Fit I meet them. Coming forward. <clears throat> Hail, worthy Timon. Our late noble master. Have I once lived to see two honest men? Oh, sir, having often of your open bounty tasted, hearing you were retired, your friends fallen off, whose thankless natures, oh, abhorred spirits, not all the whips of heaven are large enough. What to you? whose star-like nobleness gave life and influence their whole being. I am wrapped and cannot cover the monstrous bulk of this ingratitude with any size of words. Let it go naked, men may see it better. That you are honest by being what you are, make them best seen and known. He and myself have travailed in the great shower of your gifts and sweetly felt it. Hi. You are honest men. We are here to come to offer your service. Most honest men. Why, how shall I requite you? Uh, can you eat roots and drink cold water? No. What we can do will do to do your service. You're honest men. You've heard that I have gold. I'm sure you have. Speak truth. You're honest men. So it is said, my noble lord, but therefore king, not my friend, nor I. Good, honest man, thou drawst a counterfeit, best in all Athens. Out, indeed, the best, thou counterfeit most lively. So, so, my lord. In so, sir, as I say, and for thy fiction, why, thy verse swells with stuff so fine and smooth that thou art even natural in thine art. <laughs> but for all this, my honest-natured friends, I must needs say you have a little fault. Marry, tis not monstrous in you, neither wish I you take much pains to mend. Beseech your honour to make it known to us. Now you'll take it ill. Most thankfully, my lord. Will you, indeed? Doubt it not, worthy lord. There's never a one of you. Do we, my lord? It's a knave that mightily deceives you. Oh, do we, my lord? Aye. And you hear him cog, see him dissemble, know his gross patchery, love him, feed him, keep him in your bosom, yet remain assured but he's a made-up villain. I know not such, my lord. Nor I. Look you. I loved you well. I'll give you gold. Rid me these villains from your companies. Hang them or stab them, drown them in a draught, confound them by some force, and come to me. I'll give you gold enough. Name, Name them, my lord. 
Let's know Let's them. Let's know them. Do that way and do this. Two in company. Each man apart, all single and alone. Yet when arch villain keeps him company, if where thou art two villains shall not be, come not near him. If thou wouldst not reside but where one villain is, then him abandon. Hence, pack, there's gold. You came for gold, you slaves. You have worked for me. There's payment for you. Hence, you are an alchemist. Make gold of that out, rascal dogs. Eats them out and then retires to his cave. Enter Flavius and two senators. It is in vain that you would speak with Timon, for he said himself only that nothing but himself, which looks like man, is friendly with him. Bring us to his cave. It is our part and promise to the Athenians to speak with Timon. At all times alike, men are not still the same. It was time and griefs that framed him thus. <clears throat> time, with his fairer hand, offering the fortunes of his former days, the former man may make him. Bring us to him and chance it as it may. Here is his cave. Peace and content be here, Lord Timon. Timon, look out and speak to friends, the Athenians. By two of the most reverend senate, greet thee. Speak to them, noble Timon. Timon comes from his cave. Our son that comfortest, learn. Speak and be hanged for each true word of blister, and each false be as cauterizing to the root of the tongue, consuming it with speaking. Worthy Timon. Of none but such as you, and you of Timon. The senators of Athens greet thee, Timon. I thank them, and would send them back the plague, could I but catch it for them. Oh, forget what we are sorry for ourselves in thee. The senators with one consent of love entreat thee back to Athens, who have thought on special dignities, which vacant lie for thy best use and wearing. They confess toward thee forgetfulness too general, gross which now the public body, which doth seldom play the recanter, feeling in itself a lack of Timon's aid, hath sense with all of its own fail, restraining aid to Timon, and send forth us to make their sorrow rendered. Together, the recompense more fruitful than their offense can weigh down by the dram. I even such heaps and sums of love and wealth as shall to thee blot out what wrongs were theirs and write in thee the figures of their love, ever to read them thine. You witch me in it, surprise me to the very brink of tears. Lend me a fool's heart and a woman's eyes, and I'll beweep these comforts, worthy senators. Therefore, so please thee to return with us and all of our Athens, then and ours to take the captainship. Thou shalt be met with thanks, allowed with absolute power and thy good name live with authority. So soon we shall drive back of Alcibiades, the, the approach is wild, who, like a boar too savage, root, doth root up his country's peace. And shakes his threatening sword against the walls of Athens. Therefore, Timon... Well, sir, I will. Therefore, I will, sir. Thus... If Alcibiades kill my countrymen, let Alcibiades know this of Timon, that Timon cares not. But if be sack fair Athens and take our goodly aged men by the beards, giving our holy virgins to the stain of contumelious, beastly, mad-brained war, then let him know, and tell him Timon speaks it, in pity of our aged and our youth, I cannot choose but tell him that I care not, and take, let him take it at worst. For their knives care not, while you have throats to answer. For myself there's not a whittle in the unruly camp, but I do prize it at my love before the reverendest throat in Athens. So I leave you to the protection of the prosperous gods, as thieves to keepers. Stay not, all is in vain. Why? I was writing of my epitaph. 
it will be seen tomorrow. My long sickness of health and living now begins to mend, and nothing brings me all things. Oh, live still. Alcibiades, your plague, you his, and last so long enough. We speak in vain. Yet I love my country, and am not one that rejoices in the common wreck, as common Bruit doth put it. That's well spoke. Amend me to my loving countrymen. These words become your lips as they pass through them. Enter into our ears like great triumphers in their applauding gates. Commend me to them, and tell them that to ease them of their griefs, their fears of hostile strokes, their aches, losses, their pangs of love, with other incident throes that nature's fragile vessel doth sustain in life's uncertain voyage, I will some kindness do them. I'll teach them to prevent wild Alcibiades wrath. I like this well. He will return again. I have a tree which grows here in my close, but mine own use invites me cut down, and shortly must I fell it. Tell my friends, tell Athens, in the sequence of degree, from high to low throughout, that whoso pleases to stop affliction, let him take his haste, come hither, ere my tree hath felt the axe, and hang himself! I pray you do my greeting! Pull him no further, thus you shall still find him. Come not to me again, but say to Athens, Timon hath made his everlasting mansion upon the beached verge of the salt flood, who once a day with his embossed froth the turbulent surge shall cover. Thither come, and let my gravestone be your oracle. Lips, let sour words go by, and language end. What is a miss, plague, and infection mend? Graves only be men's works, and death their gain. Sun, hide thy beams. Timon hath done his reign. Retires to his cave. His discontents are unremovably coupled to nature. Our hope in him is dead. Let us return and strain what other means is left unto us in our dear peril. It requires a swift foot. Exeunt. Act five, scene two, before the walls of Athens. Enter two senators and a messenger. Thou hast painfully discovered, are his files as full as they report? We stand much hazard if they bring not time in. I met a courier, one mine ancient friend, whom, though in general part we were opposed, yet our old love made a particular force and made us speak like friends. This man was riding from Alcibiades to Timon's cave with letters of entreaty, which imported his fellowship in the cause against your city, in part for his sake moved. Uh, here come our brothers. Enter the senators from Timon. No talk of Timon, nothing of him expect. The enemy's drum is heard and fearful scouring doth choke the air with dust. In and prepare ours is the fall. I fear our foes the snare. Exeunt. Act five, scene <clears throat> The woods, Timon's cave, and a rude tomb scene. Enter a soldier seeking Timon. By all description, this should be the place. Who's here? S speak, ho. Oh. No answer. What is this? Timon is dead? Who hath outstretched his span? Some beast reared this? There does not live a man. Dead? Sure. And this his grave? 
what's on this tomb I cannot read? The character I'll take with wax, our captain hath in every figure skill and a great interpreter, though young in days. Before proud Athens, he sat down by this, whose fall the mark of his ambition is. Exit. Act four, scene four, before the walls of Athens. Trumpets sound, enter Alcibiades with his powers. Sound to this coward and lascivious town our terrible approach. A parley sounded, enter senators on the walls. Till now you have gone on and filled the time with all licentious measure making your wills the scope of justice. Till now myself and such as slept within the shadow of your power have wandered with our traversed arms and breathed our sufferance vainly. Now the time is flush when crushing marrow in the bearer strong cries of itself no more. Now breathless wrong shall sit and pant in your great chairs of ease and Percy insolent shall break his wind with fear and horrid flight. Noble and young, when thy first griefs were but a mere conceit, ere thou hadst power or we had cause of fear, we sit to thee to give thy rages balm, to wipe out our ingratitude with loves above their quantity. So did we woo transformed Timon to our city's love by humble message and by promised means. We were not all unkind, nor all deserve the common stroke of war. These walls of ours were not erected by their hands from whom you have received your griefs, nor are they such that these great towers, trophies, and schools should fall by private faults in them. Nor are they living, who were the motives that you first went out. Shame that they wanted cunning, in excess hath broke their hearts. March, noble lord, into our city with thy banners spread, by decimation and a tithe of death. If thy revenge is hunger for that food which nature loathes, take thou the destined tenth, and by the hazard of the spotted die, let die the spotted. All have not offended. For those that were, it is not square to take on those that are revenges. Crimes like lands are not inherited. <clears throat> then, dear countrymen, Bring in thy ranks, but leave without thy rage. Spare thy Athenian cradle and those kin which in the bluster of thy wrath must fall with those that have offended. Like a shepherd, approach the fold and call the infected forth, but kill not altogether. What thou wilt, thou rather shalt enforce it with thy smile than hew it to it with thy sword. Set but thy foot against but ram rampered gates, and they shall ope, so thou wilt send thy gentle heart before, to say thou'rt enter friendly. Throw thy glove, or any token of thine honor else, that thou wilt use the wars as they redress, and not as our confusion. All thy powers shall make their harbor in our town, till we have sealed thy full desire. Then there's my glove. Descend and open your uncharged ports. Those enemies of Timon's and mine own, whom you yourselves shall set out for reproof, fall and no more. And to atone your fears with my more noble meaning, not a man shall pass his quarter or offend the stream of regular justice in your city's bounds, but shall be rendered, rendered to your public laws at heaviest answer. Is most nobly spoken. Descend, and keep your words. The senators descend and open the gates. Enter, soldier. My noble general, Timon is dead, entombed upon the very hem of the sea, and on his gravestone this in sculpture, which with wax I brought away, whose soft impression interprets for my poor ignorance. Reads the epitaph. Here lies a wretched course of wretched soul bereft. Seek not my name, a plague consume you wicked caitiffs left. Here lie I, Timon, who alive all living men did hate. 
Pass by and curse thy fill, but pass and stay not here thy gate. These well express in thee thy latter spirits, though thou abhorrest in, our, in us our human griefs. Scornst our brains flow and those our droplets from which niggard nature fall, yet rich conceit taught thee to make vast Neptune weep for I on thy low grave, on faults forgiven. Dead is noble Timon, of whose memory hereafter more. Bring me into your city, and I will use the olive with my sword. Make war breed peace, make peace stint war, make each prescribe to other as each other leech. Let our drums strike. Exeunt. That concludes the International Shakespeare Players reading of Timon of Athens. Thank you all for being with us tonight. Join us next time for Macbeth.